this perfection of always wanting to have the answer and the scripture and the biblical reference for every little detail in life is really beginning to piss me off. So Kirk Franklin is speaking out and using his words, not mine, y'all forgive me, but he says that he's beginning to get pissed off. And the reason why that's happening and the reason why we should address is because it's also something that a lot of, a large number of people are also expressing the same thing. So I want to go ahead and delve into this because it's something that needs to be brought up. It's vitally important, not just for those who um, are fans of Kirk, also for those who do not like Kirk Franklin. This is something that I think the entire body ought to hear. So let's go and listen to this. So, hey, it is 1130 on the East Coast. I'm a little tired, a little sleepy. So there's no telling what I'm about to say. Well, that's number one. You probably ought to do, do, not do it like that. You probably, if it's light, late at night and you're bothered or frustrated, you probably ought to go ahead and think out, think about what it is you're going to say. So you don't say things the wrong way. Just, you know, think things through like, like an adult should do. I think that we got to reconsider this goal of making everything so pretty and wrapped in this pretty bow. Every time somebody is a Christian, they want to try to talk in ways, well, you know, God did this. It's like this perfection of always wanting to have the answer and the scripture and the biblical reference for every little detail in life is really beginning to piss me off. Why? Okay, it's really beginning to piss you off. Why? Let, let's listen more and what he's saying. Ladies and gentlemen, if you feel this way, and there are a lot of folks that do feel this way, not kind of what Kirk's saying, but on their own, there's a huge problem. When I say a huge problem, I'm talking about a gigantic problem with this. It's really beginning to be very frustrating because it's like we want to quote and represent the things of faith that are comfortable for us. But again, when you're talking about a book that's full of liars, adulterers, whoremongers, murderers, thieves, like nobody in the Bible was pretty. Nobody in the Bible had this clean, pretty life. But in real time, y'all keep wanting to make everything so pretty and so packaged well that it's like... If your way was working, Christianity in America would be growing. There would be an increase. But it's like you see the numbers. You see the numbers of people that don't believe. You see the numbers. So Kirk is saying that people who are, I guess, you know, the old saying, people who want to be holier than thou, that's what's driving people off. You look at the numbers and church attendance is down. Well, this is something about that God actually prophesied that we're told that these things are going to happen. But he's blaming it, I think, on the wrong thing. We're going to flesh that out a little bit. Let's just let him speak a little bit more. The numbers of people that are leaving, but y'all still want to keep holding on to the fact that y'all are, y'all are, y'all are like experts in the, in the text, in the Aramaic, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, instead of realizing that everything in Christianity is not going to be wrapped in a perfect bow. Life is not fair. And life is is not easy. It was not easy in the text. It ain't easy now. I'm in Orlando. It's my, I'm, I'm not in Florida. And these people have been hit with all of these storms, folk going through a lot of bull with the government. Insurance companies are leaving them without the houses getting fixed. And y'all still want to throw scriptures at people. There's the problem. He has a problem when someone is going through that someone who, I guess, tries to speak a word to them runs to the text. Now, I'll be honest, there are times where the wrong person is trying to speak. They don't know how to comfort people. And so they might use scriptures and they use them kind of in a rough fashion and ends up hurting people. Well, that's not the scripture. That's the person. And so what he's speaking about, listen, you have it all wrong. Kurt, let me tell you, because I can speak from experience. People know who this cup is. This is my cup. We call him Joey. Joey has been with me since 2007 and at the worst time of my life. And that's why I hold on to him because he was there. This cup was there. I'm speaking like as a person was there when I was at the very bottom that I could possibly be in. During this time, I had actually just lost my father. 
I'm now in prison, the wor- the the most violent prison in 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 the Federal Bureau of Prisons at the time. And after that, my mother's going to pass away. Uh, they've given me 240 months. Praise God, I didn't have to serve all of that. But I know what it's like to be down and in the worst situations possible. And Kurt, do you know what comforted me? Well, the very thing that you are railing against. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit how this works, how it benefits you, and how what Kirk is saying is dangerous. Well, here's a scripture that I want to throw at you. The Bible says rejoice with those that rejoice and mourn with those that mourn. Y'all are so pretty, wanted to wrap everything in a perfect bowl that you don't even give yourself a chance to feel the pain that people go through. Y'all want stuff, you want to throw scriptures and stuff so quickly that you just don't even give people the opportunity to mourn, to hurt. Okay, so Kurt, you're just so wrong. But let me just, before I, I, I get serious for a second, let's just kind of really just say what really Kurt is thinking. I'm sick and tired of y'all using this Bible uh, when it's needed. I'm tired of that. Y'all always got to bring up the word Bible this, Bible that, John this, Matthew that. I'm tired of that. Don't y'all know that people are hurting and they don't want to hear about this Bible mess? Y'all gonna make me go put on some tight pants and take my shirt off and shake my behind like I'm a gospel prince or a gospel James Brown. That's what y'all gonna make me do. Y'all beginning to piss me off. That's really what I want y'all to say. Stop using this Bible because this Bible ain't letting me do what I want to do. That's really what Kirk is saying. Kirk is really pointing people away from the Bible. Notice what he's bothered by. He's bothered by the word and words of God. Hurt with people. Why don't y'all want to hurt with people? Cole, shut up. When people are going through something, shut up. Now, there's some truth to that. When you are dealing with someone, counseling someone, there is a time where you just you're just quiet. There is you just person's crying. You cry with them without question. But to say or to assume or to tell people, stay away from the word, move away from the word, don't give them the word. Well, I'm going to show in the scriptures where Kirk is 100 percent wrong. As a matter of fact, he's demonically wrong. Why don't y'all want to feel the agony of what our species goes through as humans? Folk are going through, bro. And y'all want to be so quick to just keep throwing all of these bibliocentric ideals at people instead of going, man, I can't even imagine how that mama feels having to bury her third child. Bro, y'all got to y'all y'all got to help me. Y'all got to help me. Stop trying to make Christianity so perfect and pretty and let it be ugly when it's time to be ugly. Job's life was ugly. Job's life was ugly. Paul's life in prison was ugly. <laughs> David's baby dying. After his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, that was Bathsheba. That was ugly. So you think about Job, you think about Paul, you think about David. What do they do? What did they do at their very worst? Who do they turn to? They turned to God. Let me just say this. This is important. Who you turn to at your hour of need in your worst says a lot about you, says a lot about what's in your heart, who's in your heart. There are people that ultimately end up turning to God, but only after going through their friends or to some sort of secular counselor, to the doctor, or whomever else, uh, even to the church without first going to God. They might end up going to the church and having the church be kind of a proxy, a go-between for them to God. Well, what you ought to do is go to God. And the issue is who you turn to is who has been comforting you the most, who you trust the most. At my very worst, I did not turn to anything else or anyone else. I turned to the Lord, primarily because I had no other choice. And what I mean by I have no other choice, I recognize that there's nothing or no one that is that can comfort me like him. I didn't first seek counsel of anyone else. Now, did I go and seek counsel from, did I speak to other people? Sure. But the first person, the first one that I turned to was the Lord. And when I was down, what did I do while I was turned to the Lord? I turned to his word. If when you are down and hurting and the word of God, his words, the scriptures bother you, that tells us what's not in your heart. It's foreign. It's like giving someone a drug that hurts. That's the problem. It's ugly. It's ugly. The storms of life are ugly. And life ain't fair. And God does not always make sense. 
there's some truth to that also as well. But when it doesn't make sense, what should you do? What did Jesus say? He says, come unto me, all you who are are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You have to come to him. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, the word learn is not the same word that we use for learning. It's this word, the mathete, which is that you you are finding out about me. You're spending time with me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourself. Well, how do we know that? Well, we find that and we know that in his word, Kirk. This is why you should never push people away. When someone is giving the word, maybe they're giving it to the, giving it to someone or using it inartfully or kind of harshly. But the issue isn't the word. The issue might be the person who, who's given the word. But the word is what you need. Well, in Philippians, look what it says. Uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That's who you go to. That's who, that's who you turn to. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension or understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, and notice what he says, Kirk. This is why it's important, body of Christ. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen sound like the word of God to me, Kirk Franklin. Practice these things uh, and the God of peace will be with you. You cannot have peace apart from God's word. So when you go through these storms, when you're literally in the storms of life and you cannot or will not or refuse to turn to the word of God and to God himself, well, then you're going to have problems. The problem isn't the word of God. The problem is your life is a sham and this storm is revealing it. These problems are revealing it. And what does Kirk want you to do? Uh, nothing. He wants you to not have the actual cure. He wants you to not have what actually helps. That's the word of God. That's the truth. But y'all want to throw, y'all want to throw scriptures at that. Yeah, but you man, let, let it breathe. Let it breathe. Don't be so quick to throw a script. Let it breathe. Yes, life isn't fair. And God does not always make sense. Well, how he does make sense when life seems unfair, it doesn't make sense. Uh, he tells, think about when Jesus had his, I guess, most trying time other than the cross. And even in the cross, what did Jesus turn to? Jesus turned to turn to God. And going back to when he was at his weakest moment before that was during his temptation. He is physically weak and hungry. And what happens? The devil comes to tempt him. And what does Jesus do? He gives him the word. But he said, it is written. It is written, Kirk Franklin, that man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then you come back and you say, no, let it breathe. Life is ugly. We don't need the word. That is wrong. When Paul was getting ready to die, knowing that his time on earth is is, is short, it's uh, it's ending. What does he ask for? The word of God. Bring me the books. Bring me the parchments. Why? As a matter of fact, what does he tell us to focus on? Even when false teachings come around and false teachers, he says to be aware of these false teachers, but make sure that you listen to the word of God, to sound doctrine. People are going to move away from that. That's why Paul also says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. And so that's why this is important. Kurt, you are giving people the wrong idea. You are teaching them wrong. And there are a lot of people that when they go through something, I get it. You go through something, you don't want to hear it. I get that. Well, who are those people that don't want to hear it? In many cases, they're not safe. In many cases, they think they are and are not. If this is you, if you're going through something and the last thing that you want to hear is the word of God, or if the word of God is irritating to you, it means it's not familiar. It's not at home with you. You're not comfortable with you. And so it could be possible that this particular storm is a way uh, that God is reminding you of that, that, it, that you should have these alarms going off, that something is missing. How is it that other people are going through these same things who call themselves Christian and they seem to have joy? That's how you know you have faith. Faith is exemplified when you go through these particular storms. Think about it. An actual true storm. When the disciples were in the boat with Jesus, what was their focus? The storm. Jesus is literally there with them. He wasn't their focus. And that's why Jesus got up, not only after rebuking the winds and the waves, rebukes them and says, it's as though you have no faith. Why? Because I'm literally right here with you and you're focused on those things. And could you imagine if Peter would have said, well, Lord, we don't want to hear all that. We're going through something. What are the, care us not that we perish. Uh, 
Obviously he does, but Jesus, we don't want to hear the word. All you guys have is the word, the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic. We don't want, I, I just want to let me rage. Let me scream. Well, no. How about you heal? How about you grow closer to him? Because guess what? These storms are moment, as Paul says, these light and momentary afflictions. Um, that's what they are. They're light and they're momentary. You, we are trying to get people ready for their final destination, be it heaven, hopefully not hell, and how do you know so? By placing your faith in Christ. And if you have done so, it is going to be the word of God that is going to comfort you. And maybe Kirk Franklin can't be a witness, but I know there's a lot of folks out there that are listening right now that can testify that, yeah, that has been my source of comfort. Not your songs, not something else, not my friends, not money, not food, but it's been the word of God. That is true peace. As he says, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen.